Madam President, I suggest the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
President. Senator from Florida. Mr. President, I ask consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, here we are stuck again, and I want to speak just a little bit about getting this country moving again and getting Americans earning again. This great country of ours has endured a lot. We've endured, despite civil war, the Great Depression, world wars that we've been in, assassination of leaders, and the slaughter of innocents by terrorists. This great nation of ours has confronted racism and civil unrest and political scandal at all levels, and always we've endured. In the throes of the Great Depression, the words of President Roosevelt had reassured most Americans when he said, this great nation will endure as it has endured. It will revive and it will prosper. And today we are once again walking a rugged path. Just this most recent example of the failure of the Super Committee was just the latest crash that has been caused by super rigid ideology and hyper political partisanship. And the truth be told, we're in a most difficult time in our nation's economic life, still facing a decision of how to pay for an enormous debt. And the truth be told, we owe this money mostly due to the misconduct of the money changers, the misuse of the tax code that favors special interest, and years of excessive spending. Yet there are members of this Congress who propose that we should first not address those underlying causes, that those most responsible should not even have to pay 
their fair share toward reducing the debt. And instead, they propose that we first take away from Social Security savings and Medicare health coverage of the elderly and that we pull back the hand this nation compassionately extends to those among us who are less fort fortunate. It seems some want to erase all the progress that we've made since those words of Roosevelt by declaring war not on poverty, but on the poor, the middle class, and the elderly. And because a host of our citizens face the grim problems of unemployment, loss of their homes, and depletion of their savings, this Congress should fight any measure that unfairly inflicts pain on those least responsible for our present economic condition. And so, Mr. President, the American people deserve a lot from their Congress. They deserve honesty. They expect us to work together. And they want action that is even-handed. And so as we move forward, I would hope that all our colleagues in the Senate and in the House could be guided by the words of then a young President, Kennedy, who said, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. And in this spirit, can't we work to pull our nation out of its financial doldrums? Can't we just ask, what is the right thing to do? Is it right that household income for the average American is actually in decline? Is it right that a hedge fund manager pays a lower tax rate than the person who cleans his office? Is it right that an oil company gets to write off $11 billion on its tax return because it polluted the Gulf of Mexico? Is it right that the U.S. Congress cannot agree on a deficit reduction plan because of partisan politics? And Mr. President, the American people know what's right, and they know what's not right. And if we could just for a minute put all of this partisanship aside and just do what's right, then we might be able to balance our nation's books to get this country moving again and to get Americans employed and earning again. And while we're at it, we might just restore the American public's confidence in our government. Mr. President, I yield the floor. And I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call, call the roll. Like Mr. Akaka. Mr. President. Senator from Alabama. I would ask to be, a uh, quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. And I would ask that I be allowed to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, our country is facing a very, very serious financial crisis. We're seeing what happened in Europe. We had some good numbers on the stock market uh, for a while, but if I understand what happened, there was a very real crisis. Uh, facing the Europeans, and at the very last moment, they made a, took some action that was received positively, but they're out, not out of the woods yet, and neither are we. And our debt is surging. Uh, we've gone from, I think five years ago, $161 billion deficit to $450 billion deficit in President Bush's last year to $1.2 trillion in President Obama's first year, 1.3 trillion. In President Obama's second year, 1.2 trillion this year, and over a trillion predicted in deficit next year. And so we're going to have a proposal that comes before us. It's a ranking to provide a payroll holiday. And it's sold as avoiding a tax increase. That's what the president says it is. We're avoiding a tax increase. And so we ought to ask ourselves exactly how that's so and if it's so. Let me just say I don't think that's accurate. Two years ago, 
there was an employer payroll tax holiday. They went only to the employer. It cost the Treasury $7.6 billion. Last year, as part of the final compromise, a bipartisan compromise, it was agreed that the, uh, uh, there would be a 2% tax holiday for working persons. So instead of paying 6 plus percent on your withholding tax, you'd pay 4. That cost $111 billion for that year. So the president says if we don't extend that, we're going to have a tax increase. But is he accurate? No, not really. This year's proposal would be to reduce not the 4 percent, but the 3.1 percent, cutting the 6.2 withholding to 3.1 for the employer and for the employee, and it would cost in one year $265 billion. $265 billion that would not be going into the Social Security Trust Fund so that those who retire would have the retirement funds they've been promised would not go there. It weakens Social Security, the integrity of the system, in my opinion. But we're told not to worry. The United States Treasury will replace this $265 billion with Treasury money. But the problem is the Treasury doesn't have any money. The Treasury is already in debt. The Treasury is going to add another $1 trillion to the deficit this year. And so now it's going to be added to a $265 billion more in one fell swoop, in one bill, right here at the end of the session. And if you don't vote for it, the president says, you're raising taxes on the American people. That's not an accurate statement. In an economic sense, in my opinion, the real essence of this is the United States Treasury will borrow $265 billion. And then it will direct the Social Security Administration uh, to send that money out in the form of a reduced benefit, the reduced withholding amount to be paid by workers. It's a direct borrow, and it's a direct delivery of money, and it uses Social Security a trust fund uh, monies as a vehicle to transfer the money. But in economic sense, it borrows $265 billion to spend. Now, how much is $265 billion? The super committee, the committee of 12, was trying to find $1,200 billion in savings over 10 years. Not one year, 10 years. And this one bill, this one proposal of $265 billion would be spent this one year to achieve the Committee of Twelve's goal, they would simply need it to have cut $120 billion a year for 10 years out of the entire federal government. They failed. Immediately now, the President and our Majority Leader is demanding this Congress pass an expenditure, unexpected, not before done, Nothing like such a large expenditure ever has come out of Social Security to spend another $265 billion. How will we ever get our house in order? I wish I could figure out a way to be supportive of this. I don't see how I can be. I am pleased that the Republicans are trying to work up a bill that would not cost as much as $265 billion and some way to pay for it but in truth, if we're going to be able to cut spending to pay for any kind of uh, new expenditure, wouldn't we be better to do what the Committee of Twelve tried to do, cut spending to reduce the debt? Wouldn't, shouldn't we be seeking ways, if we're going to raise taxes, to use those taxes to pay down the debt, instead of taking ten years under the President's plan to pay in a new tax it takes 10 years of that tax to pay for this one year of the expenditure. And that's what the proposal is. I, am, I would say to my colleagues, 
This goes beyond partisan politics. This gets to the point, are we in control of the Treasury and the spending of the United States of America? Can we defend what we're doing? And don't think that's the only thing that's going to come up. I, our budget committee, I'm the ranking Republican on the budget committee, we look at these numbers. This also will be taken care of in December. Count on it. We're going to deal with the alternative minimum tax. That's going to cost $50 billion. We're going to deal with unemployment insurance, additional $70 billion to extend those payments beyond 90 some odd weeks. We're going to fix the doctor's payment because we have to. We can't cut the doctors that much. $21 billion. We're going to extend most, if not all, of the tax extenders, we call them, $90 billion. The total is $500 billion. Now, some of this we've been expecting to take care of, but we weren't expecting or planning in any way to have a continuation of the payroll holiday that's going to cost $265 billion. I just would say to my colleagues, when are we going to think more rationally about it? Now, I just heard, well, how are we going to pay for these AMT, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, doctor's uh, payments, and the tax extenders? Somebody said, well, we're just going to count the savings from the war. The Congressional Budget Office will show that the decline in expenses for the Iraq and Afghanistan war uh, will be a savings. We can just spend that. That is fraudulent, that's a gimmick, and it should not be acceptable. Everybody knows the war costs are going to be coming down, and we've been planning for that. You can't assume that that money is available to spend willy-nilly. We were bringing the war costs down to bring the debt down not to fund new spending. We need to bring the war costs down to try to reduce our debt and our deficit, not to fund new spending. But that's how they're going to do this, I've been told, and I'm not surprised because there's no other way they're going to do it. So, Mr. President, I just would share that as we'll be voting in a little bit on this issue. I don't know what their answer is. I don't know how to fix our problem. But I know one thing, we remain in denial. Our country is in greater debt crisis than we realize. Uh, Mr. Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson of President Obama's Debt Commission said we are facing the most predictable financial crisis in our nation's history as a result of our debt. And uh, we need to get serious about how to fix it. I thank the chair and would yield the floor. Mr. President. S Senator from Maryland. Uh, yes, unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, today I rise to address a human rights issue of deep concern. For two years since December 3rd, 2009, an American citizen and a Marylander, Alan Gross, has been imprisoned by the Cuban government. Two years he's been held by the Cuban authorities. Alan was in Cuba to help the country's small Jewish community establish an intranet and improve its access to internet access, which would allow the community to go online without fear of censorship or monitoring. After being held for 14 months without charge and then a cursory two-day trial, he was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. His appeal to the Cuban Supreme Court was denied in August of this year. Alan Gross is a caring husband and a father, a devoted man who has dutifully promoted U.S. foreign policy interests while serving the needs of thousands of foreign citizens from Afghanistan to Haiti over a career that has spanned more than 25 years, 25 years of public service. Unfortunately, Allen has been caught in the middle of a conflict between two nations with a long and difficult relationship. But it's entirely unacceptable that his personal freedoms have been violated every day that he continues to be incarcerated. Allen's health has deteriorated during his imprisonment. 
He's lost 100 pounds and suffers from a multitude of medical conditions, including gout, ulcers, arthritis, that have worsened without adequate treatment. Mr. President, last night I had a chance to talk to his wife, Judy, who had a chance to visit with her husband in Cuba uh, earlier last month. Judy informs me that Alan Gross's health conditions are deteriorating and that he is in need of adequate health care. In addition, his mother and daughter are both struggling with serious health care issues, and his wife is struggling to make ends meet. The Gross family should not have to suffer through such a trying period of time without Alan for support. Sentencing Alan Gross to 15 years behind bars also sentences his family to 15 years without a husband, father, and son. There is no reason for the Gross family to continue to suffer the consequences of political gamemanship any longer. I urge the Cuban government to remember that this is a real man and a family who are suffering. I have already written the Cuban government urging them in the strongest possible manner to immediately and unconditionally release Alan Gross. His continued imprisonment is a major setback in our bilateral relations and is unlikely that any positive steps to improve that relationship can or will happen while he remains in prison. As a United States Senator and as a Marylander and as a fellow human being, I urge the Cuban government to see Alan Gross who has dedicated his life to serving others for who he is, a man who believed he was helping others by st stepping in when he saw a need. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. I call on the Cuban government to release Alan Gross immediately and to allow him to return to his family. Mr. President, with that, I would um, yield the floor. Just the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, I ask uh, unanimous consent that further proceedings under the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that upon the conclusion of the post-cloture time, the pending germane Feinstein Amendment 1126 be the pending business, that the Senate proceed to votes in relation to the following Feinstein amendments in the order listed, Feinstein number 1126 and Feinstein number 1456, that there be two minutes equally divided in the usual form prior to the second vote. There will be more time than that prior to the first vote. That no amendment be in order to either amendment prior to the votes and that all post-cloture time be considered expired at 6 p.m. Is there objection? Uh, Mr. President, uh, reserve Senator the Senator from Arizona. I object, and I will not object for the benefit of our colleagues. Uh, after uh, spirited discussions for a long period of time, we have reached a, um, a compromise with the Senator from California on language cons that, uh, concerning detainees and uh, there are certain members on my side who wanted a vote on the original amendment as written. We have modified it, and there will be so that, and there, there, so that there will be a vote on the original Feinstein amendment, and then one which is modified by agreement between uh, most of the uh, people involved. There may be some who are still uh, oppose it, but we have reached an agreement between the Senator from California, the Chairman me, uh, Senator from Idaho, Senator from South Carolina, and others that I think will be agreeable to the majority of the members. And I would suggest to my friend, the Chairman, that when that vote starts at 6, perhaps we can line up the other remaining amendments, which some of which we hope will get voice votes, some of which will require recorded votes, as, as is the procedure under post-cloture. Mr. President. Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. No, uh, Mr. President, we, it has not yet been uh, ruled on, and I want to uh, modify very slightly uh, what I uh, said in the unanimous consent agreement. I said that the Senate proceed to votes in relation to the following Feinstein amendments. I should have said the Senate proceed to votes on the Feinstein amendments in the order listed. Is there rejection, uh, um, objection to the request as modified? No rejection. Without objection and rejection. Now, Mr. President, two other unanimous consent requests before we turn this over to the uh, Senator from California. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that it be in order to make a point of order in block against the list of amendments in violation of Rule 22 that is at the desk. Is there objection? Uh, the point of order, oh, without objection, the point of orders are sustained and the amendments fall. Mr. President, I'm sorry. Mr. President. In the minutes Arizona. remaining between now and 6 p.m., I would hope that we could roughly divide time on, on the amendment between the two sides. Mr. President. Uh, Senator from Michigan. I would hope, in fact, I would ask that the time between now and 6 o'clock be divided uh, between uh, the two sides, and we will yield immediately to uh, Senator Feinstein. Without objection. Senator from California. No, Mr. President. No. I have one more unanimous consent agreement. Oh. Senator from Michigan. I ask unanimous consent that it be in order to make, excuse me, I ask unanimous consent that the following amendments be withdrawn. Rubio number 1290 and Merkley 1256. Is there objection? Without objection, the amendments are withdrawn. I want to, I want to thank the presiding officer and all those that have been involved in working out this approach that allows us now to vote uh, on two amendments, the original Feinstein amendment that's pending, plus an alternative which I think will hopefully command a great support. Mr. Time's remaining. Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes is all divided in half? Eight minutes on each side. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, give uh, two minutes. You want time? Uh, two minutes, three minutes to the senator 
on my side, the three, three minutes for the senator from South Carolina, preceded by two minutes from the senator from Idaho, and uh, two minutes for the senator from New Hampshire if she arrives here. Shall I go first? Um, yeah, Mr. President. Senator from California. Mr. President, I'd like to explain what has happened this long afternoon. Uh, originally, uh, some of us, namely Senators Leahy, Durbin, Udall of Colorado, Kirk, Lee, Harkin, Webb, Wyden, Merkley, and myself, realized that there was a fundamental flaw in Section 1031 of the bill. And there is a difference of opinion as to whether there is this fundamental flaw or not. We believe that the current bill um, essentially updates and restates the authorization for use of military force that was passed on September 18, 2001. And despite my support for a general detention authority, the provision in the original bill, in our view, went too far. That the bill before us would allow the government to detain U.S. citizens without charge until the end of hostilities. We have had long discussions on this. Um, the distinguished chairman, the distinguished ranking member, the senator from North Carolina believe that was not their intent. And that these discussions went on and on. And they resulted in two amendments. Our original amendment, which covers only U.S. citizens, which says that they cannot be held without charge or trial and a compromise amendment, which I shall read. On page 360, between lines 21 and 22, insert the following language. Nothing in this section shall be construed to affect existing law or authorities relating to the detention of United States citizens or lawful resident aliens of the United States or any other persons who are captured or arrested in the United States. I believe this meets the concerns of the leadership of the committee, and this is presented as an alternative. There are those of us that would like to vote for the original legislation, which I intend to do, as well as for this modifying amendment. They will appear before you as a side-by-side, -side. so everyone will have the chance to vote yay or nay on the original, or yay or nay on the compromise. As I said, I would urge that we vote yes on both. Now, this is not going to be the world as we see it post-vote. But I will tell you this, that the chairman and the ranking member have agreed that the modified language presented in the second vote will be contained in the conference that they will do everything they can to contain this language in the conference. The original amendment, my original amendment, which affects only U.S. citizens, that is not the case. They are likely to drop that amendment. So I want to make the point by voting for both, and I would hope others would do the same. I think a lot has been gained I think a clear understanding has been gained of the problems inherent in the original bill. I think members came to the conclusion that they did not want to change present law, and they wanted to extend it not only to citizens, but to resident aliens, as well, legal resident aliens, as well as any other persons arrested in the United States. That would mean they should not, or could not, be held without charge, and without trial. So the law would remain the same as it is today and has been practiced for the last 10 years. I actually believe that, you know, it's easy to say either my way or the highway. I want to get something done. I want to be able to assure, assure people in the United States that their rights under American law are protected. 
The modified amendment, which is the second amendment you will be voting on, does that. It provides that assurance that the law will remain the same and will not affect the right of charge and the right of trial of any United States citizen, any lawful legal alien, or any other person in the United States. And we have the commitment of both the chairman and the ranking member that they will defend that in conference. Now, there are those who say, I want to just vote for the original amendment. That's fine. I'm not sure it'll pass. I don't know whether it'll pass or not. But in my judgment, the modification is eminently suitable to accomplish the task at hand and has the added guarantee of the support of the chairman, the ranking member, in a conference committee with the House, which I think is worth a great deal. And I believe they've given their word. I believe they will keep it. This record will reflect that word. And so I would like to call up my amendment, number 1456, uh, which is the original amendment. Um, right. clerk will report. No, the, excuse me, let me just change this. 1456 is the modification. The clerk will report the amendment. The Senator from California, Mrs. Feinstein, proposes an amendment numbered 1456. On page 360. Uh, I think if you would dispense with the reading, that would be fine. I believe there are others who wish to speak, so I will yield the floor. Uh, How much? How much time is there on uh, our... About a minute. Pardon? A minute. Well, uh, I wanted to have a couple of minutes, and I w I'll split. Uh, yeah. I wonder... Yeah, uh, we've got to get you in, too. Senator no. McCain here, is there be an objection to extending this by 10 minutes equally divided? Is there objection? He's not here to... Is there objection? I'm not going to do that without him here. Um, is your, your side ready to go? Yes. I think. Why don't you start using the time on your side, and then I'll ask for that extension. Okay, how much time do we have? Uh, eight minutes. Uh, three, you're allotted three minutes, Senator. Okay. Senator from South Carolina is allotted three minutes. Thank you. And would the Senator please inform me when I use two? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, to Senator Feinstein, I do believe that the second provision uh, is where we want to be, at least from my point of view. To my colleagues, I never intended by 1031 to change the law imposing a greater burden on American citizens or more exposure to military detention, nor did I want to create additional rights beyond what exists today. The problem I have with Senator Feinstein's amendment, it says the authority described in this section for the armed forces of the United States to detain a person does not include the authority to detain a citizen of the United States without trial until the end of hostilities. Here's my concern. When you tell a judge, as a defense attorney, I want my client's rights preserved regarding a civilian trial guaranteed in this section, and the end of hostilities could be 30 years from now, Your Honor, if these rights mean anything, they need to attach now. And if the civilian rights attach immediately upon detention, what I think could be a problem, the military interrogation is lost. American citizens are not subject to military commission trial. A lot of people on my side didn't like that, but I really do want to make sure American citizens go into Article III courts. But the law has been for since World War II, if you join the enemy, even as an American citizen, you're subject to being detained for interrogation purposes. And that is my goal, and that's only been my goal. You can detain an American citizen who's sided with Al-Qaeda if they're involved in hostile acts to gather intelligence, and I think that is a proper thing to, to be doing now. It was done in World War II when American citizens helped the Nazis. If American citizens wants to help Al-Qaeda involved in a hostile act, then they become an enemy of this nation. They can be humanely detained. And uh, that is my concern about your amendment, that it would take that away. We have common ground on the Second Amendment. And, and at the end of the day, the Senate has talked a lot about different things. This has been a discussion about something important, and I've quite frankly enjoyed it. <laughs> With that, I yield.